Breaches and cybersecurity incidents are making headlines every day. What are you doing to be prepared? Welcome to the Tripwire Cybersecurity Podcast, brought to you by Tripwire, the show that explores cybersecurity for the enterprise and how to identify and protect against cyber threats before they happen. Listen for techniques and best practices to harden your defenses against hackers. Now, here's your host, Tim Erlin. Welcome, everyone, to the Tripwire Cybersecurity Podcast. I am Tim Erlin, Vice President of Product Management and Strategy at Tripwire. And today I am joined by Dale Peterson, who is the founder and chair of S4 Events and the CEO of Digital Bond and has been in the cybersecurity for industrial environment space for many, many years. I don't know if you want to put a number on those number of years, Dale, uh, or if you'd like to keep it vague, but it's been quite a while, I think. Yeah, I stumbled into it in 2000, actually. I did my first water SCADA assessment back then when I had no idea what SCADA was and <laughs> been learning and enjoying it since then. Yeah, and it's been an industry that's had some interesting interesting changes and certainly has come to the forefront in, in recent years. Uh, most recently, last week, uh, there was a very high profile uh, public disclosure of an attack on a water treatment plant in Florida. And I think um, we certainly couldn't get through this podcast without talking about that event. So it probably makes sense for us to start with, you know, at this point in time, what do we know about what happened at that water treatment plant? Well, in a sense, it was a very small event that created a large ruckus because it was a uh, a small municipal water utility uh, in Old Smart, which is in Florida, that services about 15,000 people. And you could almost think of it as being not protected in any way. It's almost as if you had your web server and you hadn't patched it for vulnerabilities and were using default credentials. It was just easy pickings for anyone who wanted to get to it. But what made it a little bit unique was that someone actually found it connected up to it and using remote control software, TeamViewer in this case, actually changed, made some changes to increase the level of lie dramatically in the system. Uh, and I guess the, eventually they would have found, it could have caused a problem, they said in 24 to 36 hours, if no one detected it, it could have caused a problem to the drinking water that could have been harmful to people. But the odds of that happening were very, very small because it was such a large increase. There were alarms all over the place. So really from the standpoint of it impacting people or being a sophisticated hack, it was really a non-event. It was, again, low-hanging fruit that someone found and decided to change. But it, it did raise a, a large alarm. You saw it on the front pages of most of the sites, uh, news sites, not just the security sites, but the general news sites because in theory, it could have caused some harm, even though the likelihood of that was incredibly small. Yeah, I mean, I think the, there are two two sides of or two categories of detail there for us to understand. One is the the sort of what what happened from a narrative standpoint. I think you you covered that. Someone accessed the the control system, made a change uh, that, uh, in theory, would have um, impacted the the water quality, uh, although it would have been caught. Um, as stated by you know any number of failsafes, and that importantly, I think there was an operator who happened to be sitting at a console and watched this happen and changed it back immediately, knowing that there was something wrong. the The other side of that equation is the technical piece of it. You mentioned the Team Viewer software, which is you know software for remote access that was used um, presumably by someone nefarious uh, to make that change. And that Team Viewer software, from what we understand now, uh, was routinely used by um, you know employees to uh, you know log in remotely and monitor the system and was using a common password I think is the most recent piece of information that I've seen um, did I miss anything in there Dale or does that jive with what you've seen as well no that's that's accurate and we see a lot of use of team Ver team viewer and VNC and these other programs to allow for remote control the large organizations, will have some security around their remote access. They'll typically have a VPN with two-factor authentication and such. But in this case, and this is really a challenge for the small utilities, and just like even it doesn't have to be a utility, it could be a small manufacturer or something like that, where their IT team is so low that they don't even think about having an OT team. 
So they, they tend to not do things well. And that's, if anything, this pointed out to me was that we just as an industry haven't done a good job of, of informing these small players what the most important things for them to do. Because if you look at this from an attacker standpoint, this was either done by an amateur who didn't understand the control system because the engineering and automation that you would have required to actually, let's say, hide that you did this. So you'd have to turn off all the alarms and the filters and things of that nature. They didn't even try to do anything like that. They just essentially, you know, ram down the door and then so anyone would know that there had been a break in. So they weren't that way. Or it could have been someone more sophisticated who just wanted to cause this ruckus, this, this panic out there. Yeah, that's an interesting question to consider because it, it, there was effectively, there was no way that this particular attack was going to be successful at actually impacting the water supply if that was the objective. So I think you're, you're positing that 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 couldn't been a, couldn't have been the objective unless the attacker was incredibly incompetent. So they must have been trying to do something else. Well, incompetent in engineering and automation, they could have been a very competent attacker, you know, from a cyber perspective. But hmm. if you're actually going to affect the process, you have to understand how the process works yeah. and, and make those changes. So yes, they they either didn't didn't care to ca actually cause harm and just wanted to, to make a fuss or they didn't understand that you can't just dump a bunch of lie in there and not have anyone notice it. Yeah. Walk away whistling, so to speak. Yeah, exactly. Well, I mean, that gets to one of the points that I, I wanted to cover, which is I think people have struggled, especially people outside the, the information security industry or even OT itself to understand how concerned they should be about this type of attack. It got a lot of press is this something that people should be worried about on a daily basis? Is it something that we shouldn't worry about at all? Where do you sort of put the the needle in terms of that measurement? Well, if we're talking about the general public, I put the needle very close to not at all. Uh, because right now we're seeing, we're recording this in the midst of that cold snap down in Texas. And we're seeing that there's a lot more likely large impact events out there that we need to deal with. Uh, such as now so many people don't have power because of some poor planning and poor decisions made down there. There was no cyber attack. It was just weather. We see that in Florida with hurricanes. If we look, if, if we look at maybe the specific case of small municipal water, if I'm the average person, I worry more about the safety of the chemicals used to treat the water there because I've seen some of these municipal water plants underneath highway overpasses close to schools where a truck could come off and release a lot of chemicals. So from the standpoint of the general public, this sort of thing probably isn't something they should spend a lot of time worrying about. But from a community standpoint, the people responsible for this, we obviously need to do a better job. And I think you almost have to break it down into two categories. One is the truly large critical infrastructure that have been working on this problem and need to do a better job. And, and quite frankly, I think those are the people that are really using your tripwire products and such. They're spending time and money trying to solve this problem. But then what this event highlighted to me, it's the most vivid example on how we have a lot of these small to medium ICS asset owners that can't afford to do the laundry list of things that would fall under good practice and we need to help them understand these are the most important things you should do to reduce the chance of the attack. And as in this case, you should be prepared that if you are compromised, it's not going to cause major harm or a high consequence event. So, I mean, if I sort of slice that up a little bit, the, the average person shouldn't be worried. You know, that's fine. I think I understand that. The you know, for to, to to use a term broadly, the asset owners for large critical infrastructure probably should be worried, but not about this particular type of attack. They've got other things to worry about. And that leaves the folks who might look like, uh, you know, an asset owner or an operator at one of these small utilities or similar industrial environment. And they should be concerned, it sounds like, that there is real worry there. There is. And I think that they've been just stuck because they've 
they look at what is recommended <laughs> from people like me and, and others, and it's a large program. Yeah. And they so say, we can't do this. So let's they talk they, about it, that. Yeah. In some cases, they do nothing because they don't know what to do out of those large number of things they could do. Uh, because I, I think this incident, um, one of the results of this type of incident, and this isn't the first incident like this to occur, is that you've got uh, the information security community, the OT cybersecurity community, however you want to draw those lines, you know, calling for um, what I would describe as as better basic security or better cyber hygiene for these types of, of environments. Is that is that the answer? Is that what we should be pushing for? Well, it depends what you mean by cyber hygiene. As a lot of people define cyber hygiene, I would say the answer is definitely no. Because I always say we're not in a race to see who can put in the most good practice security controls. The real thing we're trying to do is manage risk to an appropriate level. So if you spend a lot of time and effort, which the small organizations don't have, and, and quite frankly, even the large organizations don't have, doing things that don't move the risk needle, then you're not really accomplishing what you want. So for the small, the small organizations, this is one of the areas I actually talked to Director Krebs about when he was at CISA, was we need to be really clear on our messaging as to what they should do. We can't just say cyber hygiene. We can't say patch everything, configure everything right, do all these sorts of things because they're not going to be able to do it. And quite frankly, some of that doesn't really accomplish much. But in this specific example, I think it was a major opportunity loss because here the key item was you had insecure remote access. So if, if I were king of the world, I would have told every asset owner to ask their staff, do we have encrypted two-factor remote access to our control systems? Full stop. You know, and that, sure, that's an element of cyber hygiene, but that is a question that can be asked and answered and addressed. And, and if we look at the compromises that have happened over the last couple of years, they've come in through authorized remote access. So it, it addresses the most important attack vector. It would fall under this big cyber hygiene category, but it's something specific and actionable. So, I, I mean, the challenge I have with that is that I think there are there are numerous efforts to put together a set of of best practices that that isn't uh, you know uh, exhaustive that is intended to be really the best practices and. How do you know which of those are the ones that need to be applied versus the ones that can be put off uh, because they don't, as you as you say, move the risk needle? Well, and here I think we're still talking about reducing the likelihood side of the equation. We should get to consequence eventually uh, because mm -hmm. that's a big part of this too. But on the likelihood side, I think the key thing that most people are missing is that most of the ICS – 98, 99% plus are what I call insecure by design, meaning it's not just a lack of secure by design, but everything an attacker would do is a documented feature and function of the protocol and the control system. So sometimes security patching is the one that comes up so often. A lot of times people say you have to apply all these patches, you have to update all these operating systems, all these things mm -hmm. you need to do. But if the bad guy has gotten inside your perimeter, he doesn't need any of that to accomplish his changes to the process and, the, and to cause those high consequence events. So, yes, you might want to patch everything that's externally exposed, but you don't want to say patching is something that has to be highest priority and, and quote, cyber hygiene, because now you're expending a lot of effort without any real risk reduction. So I, that's probably the key question I would ask would be, is the security control I'm considering rendered much less effective and much less uh, resulting much less risk reduction because of this insecure by design aspect of control systems? And that's a, that's a key difference between IT and OT security in the sense that we've seen over the last couple of decades a real push for, on the IT side, systems to be secure by design. So, you know, it's not perfect by any means, but things like removing default passwords. I mean, you even have a law in California that you can't ship certain types of, of networking gear with a, um, 
a default password. You have to actually have a, a mechanism for dealing with that. Uh, you know, things being, uh, you know, failing closed as opposed to failing open, um, those kinds of things. And on the OT side, that's that's completely different. I think that's what you're pointing out. And and in fact, that it shouldn't follow the same path. Is that right? Well, until we solve these problems, until the control systems are more securable, then actually trying to make them secure is, is a losing game. And you do, unfortunately, you do get in this position where your perimeter, your remote access, you're dealing with removable media, and then some of the detection type of things that you can do are your more effective measures, as opposed to a lot of hardening and patching and things like that inside the perimeter. Mm -hmm. and obviously, anything that would allow you to get inside the perimeter needs to be as as hardened and as secure as possible. But once you're inside, it's again, it's you're only limited by your engineering and automation skills. There's no hacking skills required once you're inside the perimeter. You are listening to the Tripwire Cybersecurity Podcast. Thousands of organizations rely on Tripwire to serve as the core of their cybersecurity programs. Why? Because we detect suspicious activity before it becomes breach. Our systems work on-site and in the cloud to find, monitor, and minimize a wide range of threats. With deep system visibility and automated compliance, we help you shorten the time it takes to catch vulnerabilities and ensure your organization is following the absolute best practices in cybersecurity today. For more information, visit tripwire.com. That's tripwire.com. You mentioned the idea of control systems needing to be more securable. Can you can you talk a little bit about what that means or how they're not securable today? Well, a lot of it is is as simple as a lack of authentication. So if I want to do something, I can just read the protocol. If I want to upload new firmware, this was, this actually happened in the attack on Ukraine. They they bricked the serial to Ethernet gateways mm -hmm. because there was a command to upload firmware that didn't require authentication. So they just uploaded bad firmware and the thing stopped working. Uh, if you want to change the way uh, the recipe in a food manufacturing plant, you just upload a new recipe. So there's there's nothing saying, did this command come from a legitimate uh, machine or person? And is it a legitimate command? It just does whatever it's told. Yeah. And I think for the, the folks on the IT security side who aren't familiar with OT, it's it's actually really hard to conceptually understand how OT might work in those cases. This idea that you could upload firmware without any authentication or, uh, you know, make those kinds of changes uh, without authorization is, is, a, is in many ways a foreign concept. It's It's something that has been a well-known fact, but just wasn't really considered to be an issue for a long time in the mm -hmm. OT world as well. They said, yes, that's just the way it was. And, and you even had, you know, large organizations like Siemens and large protocols like Profibus, whose security advice was essentially keep the bad guys out. And unfortunately, given the status of the systems today, you're a lot of in many cases, that's where you are. It's keep the bad guys out, but then you have maybe 1A and 1B, detect when they're in and be able to recover if they got in. Yeah. Well, this this maybe gets us back to the, the topic that you, you suggested we get to at some point in here, which is, is reducing the impact or consequences. Um, how does that play in uh, to, the, to the OT cybersecurity side of things? Well, and this is this is really a big thing with Oldsmar. I think this is another example of this, and this might be the solution for small to medium sized organizations. But it's also something that we're finding the large organizations, large utilities, large manufacturers with you know fifty, hundred plants. It, it makes sense for them as well. Is when you look at the risk equation, you know, simple version or one version of it is likely likelihood times consequence. And security people immediately leap to more security controls to reduce the likelihood. But if you can reduce the consequence, you put a cap on your risk because the likelihood can't be higher than one. So you put a cap on your risk. It's easier to under explain to management, hey, worst case, this is what would happen. Mm -hmm. And it tends to be 
less hand wavy. It's you can actually prove this is the worst that can happen. The likelihood numbers tend to be educated guesses at best. So out at Oldsmar, for example, if they had something where, and I've seen this in tank farms and other things where someone manually checked the pH every 12 hours, there would be no way a cyber attacker would be able to disguise this attack. Uh, we've seen pressure relief valves are another thing. There's no way to hack a pressure relief valve. When the pressure's too high, it releases. You know, so things like that, it can be people, it can be processes, it, it can be systems that are not networked. So even if the bad guy completely owns and can do anything on the ICS as administrative rights, they can't cause a high consequence event or whatever they can do is considered acceptable. And I, I personally, if I was the person at that press conference that at Oldsmar, mm -hmm. if I had been able, they sort of said that they said they had redundancies, but yeah, I'm not sure they really knew that. Yeah. Right. And I don't it, think they probably really knew. Yeah. It sounded like they were implying that somewhere along the way, there was an alarm that would go off when the pH changed too much. Yes. But then the question you have to ask is, is that alarm tied into the control system? So could they use the insecure by the insecure by design nature of the event and their knowledge to say, we're going to have to just change it so that alarm never goes off. Mm -hmm. But if it was a non-networked alarm or something that was not had a hackable component to it, then that would have been great. Then they could have said, there's no way anything would have happened. Worst case, we'd have to rebuild our systems. We know we can do that within 18 hours, and we'll just run a little inefficiently during those 18 hours. You know, there's an interesting corollary here for the IT security folks who are, who are thinking about this consequence angle. Um, the corollary is around ransomware. Uh, you know, we spend a lot of effort trying to to prevent cyber attacks of different types, but we've gotten to a point where we start thinking about consequences with ransomware and the idea that even if the attack is successful, we might limit lateral movement and we might be in a position to recover from that attack. Yes, it's going to be painful. We'll have to take orders on paper, whatever that, you know, that that impact is, but that, that it limits that consequence, which is a, a corollary I hadn't thought of until now. No, that's exactly right. Recovery, reducing recovery time is another way to reduce consequence, right? Uh, and in, in some cases, you don't even think about all these. Uh, for example, I had a, an electric utility customer that the people in OT were all worried about a plant going down. Uh, generation plant and losing generation ca capacity, but the business itself said that's not a big deal to us because we're able to buy the power. Hmm. So if you can get it back up and running in in a week, that's acceptable to us. Yeah, so, yeah. So you you really have to think about it. But I would say yes on the IT side. If you're not, if you can't accept the impact of ransomware affecting all of your computers, then you probably haven't thought this through. Yeah. And it, it, it does go to that, that conversation about how you allocate your resources, which so often with security, we think more resources is always better, but we lose track of that equation and we lose track of the fact that the, the business has a mission that may not actually require perfect security. Yes. I, and I think you're really onto something there too, because one of the, one of the, other things I see that's heading in the wrong direction here is, again, you get a bunch of security people in the room. We like more and more controls, and we say security is everyone's problem, and we start to say we are now going to require our operators, our engineers, these people to do these extra 10 steps related to security, and that's probably just going down a road to failure. We should actually be trying to reduce the burden of security on these people. Because any, anything we can automate so that it doesn't require a person to do it for the thing to be secure is probably going to improve our situation. So one last question for you, Dale. When we, you know, we, there's this, this trend or conversation about, uh, we'll call it the ITOT convergence um, in security in particular. Who, who should actually own OT security or security in OT environments maybe is a better way to put that? Well, it really should be whoever the board assigns. So the board is responsible for risk or executive management if you don't have a board. And they typically look at someone for cyber-related risk, most often the CISO, 
could be the chief risk officer, but it really doesn't matter who it is. It's the board should make someone responsible for that. And then that's the person that has to drive the program. Now, that so doesn't it, mean that they don't necessarily do the work, of course. Of course. But yeah. th they are the one that makes the decisions in the end and reports up to the board. Yeah. So ultimately, it's not a question of, of you know, a, a preference for who owns it, but just that someone should. And if in your organization you're not sure who that is, then maybe the question needs to be answered. Then if – if that's not clear in your organization, that means you haven't informed the board of the risk. And we were in that situation for decades where operations said, no, nah, everything's fine. We've got it. Don't worry about it. And then the board started hearing from other people and they started looking at it and they realized there was this really silent risk that they had unknowingly accepted for a long time. And that's what got them then to assign someone to be responsible for it. The person who does it is typically in the organizations where it's worked best is a combination of IT and engineers, each handling the thing they understand best. You know, there's no reason to teach engineers how to manage firewalls and, and man a sock and things of that nature. And there's no need to try to teach IT about the process. Uh, they just need to be able to talk to each other. And we've seen that done very successfully. All right. Well, this has been a very interesting conversation. Um, I think, uh, you know, we certainly got away from the, the specific Florida incident, although it was interesting and a, a good way for us to get talking. Dale, I want to thank you for your time. Um, obviously, uh, you had a lot to contribute and I really appreciate it. And hopefully it was interesting for our listeners as well. So thank you so much, Dale. You're welcome, Tim. And thanks to everyone for listening. Uh, I hope it was worth your time and you learned something today. And I hope you'll tune in for the next episode of the Tripwire Cybersecurity Podcast. You have been listening to the Tripwire Cybersecurity Podcast. Join us next time as we explore stories of people protecting people and techniques and best practices to harden your defenses against hackers. We'll talk to you next time on the Tripwire Cybersecurity Podcast.